Hello and welcome to Celestial Chronicles, your go-to channel for exploring the profound truths of our spiritual journey. Today, we're diving deep into a topic that has intrigued many, why doesn't God, known for his boundless love, save some individuals? This query unveils a fascinating panorama about divine love. Despite its vastness and unquestionability, God remains unwavering in his principles. It's a common belief among Christians that God's will includes everyone, irrespective of their gender, age, or ethnicity, yearning for everyone's salvation. This is confirmed in the Holy Scriptures, specifically in 1 Timothy chapter 4, which proclaims God's wish for all to be saved and to gain knowledge of the truth. But what about those who seem distant from this salvation? In today's discussion, I will unveil seven profiles of individuals who might face hurdles on their spiritual journey. In other words, I will discuss seven types of people who might not attain salvation. It's crucial to stay alert. Many of us could unknowingly be obstructing our path to redemption. So, stay vigilant and introspect. Do any of these profiles align with your spiritual journey? The answer could unlock a deeper comprehension of divine love and salvation. I encourage everyone to fully engage in this discussion, participate in the prayers, and receive abundant blessings for you, your families, and friends. Before we delve into the core of this topic, I kindly request your support. Like this discussion, subscribe to our channel, and share this vital message. Every action you take aids in spreading the gospel, touching more hearts, and fortifying the kingdom of God on earth. Dear Faithful, we confront a disconcerting truth, not everyone in this world can or will be saved. This fact serves as a warning, particularly for those who regularly attend church. It's not just attending Sunday services, actively participating in the community, offering tithes, having a Christian title, speaking piously, or even baptism that guarantees salvation. The Bible, in Matthew 7 verses 21 to 22, presents Jesus' stern warning about the Day of Judgment. Many will believe they performed miracles in his name, but he will dismiss them, saying, I never knew you, depart from me, you evildoers. This message invites us all to reflect on our true position before the Divine Throne on Judgment Day. Ask yourselves, if the Lord returned today, would we be prepared and worthy, adorned in His righteousness, flawless before Him? Contemplating this is not just important, it's vital for our spiritual journey. Feel blessed to be here, participating in this discussion at such a pivotal time. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 reminds us, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive according to what he has done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, let's contemplate seven types of people who, according to scripture, cannot be saved. The first group comprises unbelievers. But who are they? They are those who do not believe in the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the Bible, these people cannot achieve salvation. The only path to redemption is through faith in God. Without this belief, no one can be saved from sins and Satan's influence. There is no other way to achieve salvation except through faith in God and belief in His Son, Jesus Christ. The well-known passage in John 3 verse 16 emphasizes that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Many may underestimate the simplicity of this redemption plan, and that's why disbelief is so perilous. Secondly, the divine cannot rescue those who pursue redemption through avenues other than Jesus Christ. John 5 verse 40 indicates that some decline to approach Jesus for life. He is the sole path to the Father, and no one reaches the Father except through him. Acts 4 verse 12 informs us that there is no other name among men by which we must be saved, except for Jesus Christ. Nothing else can redeem a person, not intellect, power, wealth, attractiveness, or even kinship or companionship. We are redeemed solely by Jesus' blood, and his crucifixion compensated for our transgressions. The subsequent group of individuals who, according to scripture, cannot be redeemed are the hypocrites. Jesus directly confronted these individuals in Matthew 23 verse 3. He chastised the teachers of the law and Pharisees, the hypocrites, for blocking the kingdom of heaven from people. They themselves do not enter, nor do they allow those attempting to enter. A hypocrite is someone who feigns to be something they are not. On Sundays, they present themselves in church with suitable attire, lifting holy hands to God, yet on the weekends, they behave like anyone else in secular settings. For them, redemption and the life of faith are mere formalities, treating the church as a social hub without genuine devotion. These individuals may publicly worship God, but they do not permit the life of Christ to truly manifest in their actions and thoughts. They can spend years in the church but do not exhibit fruits that validate the faith they profess. They are at the kingdom's door but do not enter and even obstruct others from entering. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, 9-14, we encounter the tale of a Pharisee who deemed himself righteous and scorned others. 
In contrast, Jesus lauded the humble demeanor of the tax collector who, cognizant of his sins, implored God's mercy. This narrative exemplifies the biblical caution against self-justification. In Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, we are reminded that salvation comes by grace through faith, and it is not something we can accomplish or brag about. The fifth category of individuals who cannot be redeemed are the apostates. 2 Peter 2 verses 20-22 speaks explicitly about them, stating that if anyone, after knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, becomes entangled again with the world and is overcome, their final condition is worse than the first. This highlights the gravity of deviating from the path of truth after having known it. These individuals find themselves in a worse situation in the end than at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then, after knowing it, to turn their backs on the sacred command that was delivered to them. It's as Proverbs describes, the dog returns to its vomit and the washed pig to wallowing in the mud. The Bible shows us the picture of those who become religious and abandon their corrupt and immoral practices but who, in the end, reveal their true nature and return to them. A washed pig remains a pig. These are people who toy with the fundamentals of Christian beliefs such as baptism, communion, and church attendance but who eventually reveal their true selves, returning to the world and its temptations because, in reality, they never had faith. The next category of individuals the Bible says cannot be saved are the blasphemers. Jesus addresses this topic in Matthew 12 verses 31 and 32, where he warns that every kind of sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, neither in this age nor in the coming one. Some people blaspheme against, mocking God and belittling the Holy Spirit is seen as the unforgivable sin. Therefore, it's essential to be mindful of what is said about the Holy Spirit. Avoid making jokes, affiliations, or joining groups that speak disrespectfully about God's Spirit, as this could lead to committing this unforgivable sin. According to the scriptures, the last group of people that God cannot save are those who have passed away. It's common for many to seek spiritual leaders for prayers during a loved one's funeral. However, it's crucial to understand that no prayer can alter a person's fate after their death. Salvation is only achievable while alive, after death, it becomes entirely unattainable. The concept of a purgatory, as some believe, is not backed by God's word. Salvation is only possible in life, which is why it's vital to dedicate your life to Jesus. I hope you now understand that some people may not attain salvation. This doesn't happen due to a lack of love from God, but because he cannot compromise his standard of justice to save someone. The most significant act of love was when God sent his son to die for us on the cross at Calvary, even when we were still sinners. After this supreme sacrifice, if someone chooses not to believe, God will not compromise his principles again. In conclusion, I ask you, have you genuinely accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, this is the perfect moment. The rapture is a topic widely discussed among Christians and even non-Christians. It's not just a predicted future event but a prophetic occurrence that will undoubtedly happen. The exact timing is unknown, but here's what we know from 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 to 17. According to the Lord's word, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. This is the moment we await with hope and faith. Being caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds is undoubtedly a glorious experience that every believer looks forward to with great anticipation. The rapture is an event uniquely intended for the Lord's people, those who have placed their faith in Jesus' saving grace and have turned from a life of sin. This means that no matter how many good deeds one performs on earth or how noble one's intentions, if someone is not a believer living for God, they will not be caught up when the time comes. Some believe the rapture will occur more than once, offering a second chance to those who miss the first. However, the Bible does not support this idea. Therefore, it is crucial to do everything possible to ensure you are part of this glorious experience. The rapture will happen only once and will not be repeated. Being left behind will mean facing the chaos and persecution of the Antichrist. On the other hand, for those who are caught up, it will be the beginning of an eternal reign with the Lord. The relationship between the caught-up believers and Jesus will be eternal. They will not only escape the danger of hell but will also fully embrace and enjoy what it means to have eternal life. The last enemy, which is death, will be judged and conquered. The second coming of Christ is a prophetic event that will only occur after certain end-time prophecies have been fulfilled. This implies that the rapture, a concept with various interpretations and theories, will happen before the second coming. The Bible remains the most reliable and accurate source of information about this end-time event. A widespread misunderstanding about the rapture is that it is exclusively for virtuous and moral individuals. 
However, the scriptures affirm that the rapture is for those who believe in Christ Jesus. Even if you are an exemplary citizen, generous and law-abiding, without confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you risk being left behind during the rapture. The Bible provides immense hope and solace, particularly for those who have lost loved ones who were believers in Christ. The scriptures state that the dead in Christ will rise first. So, if you have a deceased loved one who was a devout believer in Jesus Christ, there is good news. They will rise first and have the opportunity to be with the Lord in the air during the rapture. This is a cause for significant encouragement and joy. You might be wondering if it's possible to prepare for the rapture and how to do so. The answer is a definite yes. One way to prepare is to lead a life of faith and righteousness. Recall Jesus' question to his disciples in Luke 18 verse 8, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Therefore, devote yourself to activities that strengthen your faith and inspire you to lead a righteous life. Don't let anyone dissuade you from the necessity of living in faith and righteousness. Ensure that you are not only preaching about purity but also practicing it as the Lord grants you grace and wisdom. Another way to prepare for the rapture is to study and comprehend biblical teachings while living in readiness. It's vital to study God's Word and understand its principles for yourself. Every believer who commits to studying God's Word becomes a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, capable of correctly applying the Word of Truth in all life areas. It's crucial to read, study, understand, and apply the Bible, avoiding the pursuit of new revelations that, though they may seem superior, deviate from the sincere truth of God's Word. A lesson that is overly complicated, mystical, or ambiguous is not necessarily true. More often than not, the truth of God's Word is presented in a straightforward manner so that all can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Another critical way to prepare for the rapture is to stay within a community of genuine believers. Proverbs 27 tells us, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Living in a community with other believers is essential. As the popular saying goes, there is safety in numbers. The Bible encourages us not to neglect gathering with other believers and to ensure that nothing isolates us from fellowship. Isolation from the community of believers is not from God but rather a trick of the enemy. The fourth way to prepare for the rapture is to pray for guidance and strength as we live in these last days. Prayer is one of the ways we stay connected to the Lord, especially in moments when we feel alone on this heavenly journey. Pray to the Lord for guidance and strength, for our own strength may fail, but with the Lord's equipping, we will not falter. In conclusion, as you take steps to prepare for the rapture, remember that God is placing signs along the way to guide us. The Bible does not clearly specify when the rapture will occur, but we have been warned and taught to be watchful for the signs of the end times. Jesus himself instructed us about these signs and the need to stay vigilant in the last days. Jesus spoke about these events. Therefore, as these signs manifest in our days, it would be wise to pay closer attention to the scriptures than ever before. It's crucial. By loving, serving, and honoring God, we are indeed fulfilling the mandate given by Jesus. We pledge to continue doing so until the Lord's return. One of the key guidelines Jesus provided for living well in these end times is to always maintain high spiritual vigilance, steering clear of distractions that lead us away from the true path. As stated in Mark 13 verse 33 in the Amplified Version, Be on guard, stay awake, and pray, for you do not know when the time will come. For a Christian, being on guard signifies being attentive and devoted in prayer. We, as beloved saints, must remain ever vigilant, not falling into spiritual slumber. This is a call to deepen our practice of prayer as we await the Master's return. In prayer, we find grace, comfort, and patience, essential elements for navigating the challenges of these last days and escaping snares and deceptions. The current challenges necessitate that we dedicate quality time to the Lord in daily prayer. Reflect on your prayer life. How much time do you dedicate to prayer each day? Understand that it is crucial to pray continuously to understand God's will for you and the actions He desires you to take at this moment. Communicating with God gives us an advantage against the numerous plans of Satan. Many Christians have yet to realize that the world is changing daily to align with the Antichrist's agenda and that Satan is committed to leading as many saints astray as possible. But remember, he is a deceiver. Dedicating quality time to daily prayer keeps us awake and attentive to Jesus' call for awareness of his return. Sleeping, in the context of maintaining our vigilance in these last days, refers not to physical rest but to a state of spiritual insensitivity and negligence. Therefore, in this period of uncertainties and transformations, it is essential that we faithfully follow this advice of vigilance and prayer. We do not know the precise moment of the divine return. Staying spiritually awake and alert is key to not being caught off guard and being ready to face the challenges that await us. Jesus, in his instructions on how to live in these end times, emphasizes the importance of not becoming indifferent or careless concerning the things of the kingdom of God or the imminent return of Christ. He exhorts us to remain vigilant, for we do not know the hour of his return. 
We should not be carried away by fleeting trends or forget his warnings. Each believer is encouraged to be on guard, waiting with hope for the Lord's return, taking conscious steps to be cautious of anything that might threaten our focus or spiritual commitment. Being on guard means actively committed to protecting the convictions of our heart and our faith in Jesus, prioritizing everything that glorifies Him and rejecting anything that diverts our heart from Him. The third counsel from Jesus is found in Luke 21 verses 34 and 35. He sternly warns us to be careful so that our hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and the anxieties of life, for that day can come upon us suddenly like a trap. Jesus alerts us to the danger of deception from a frivolous and unrestrained lifestyle that may become common in the last days. We recall that similar events occurred in the days of Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah, and even Babylon before they were destroyed. The Bible recounts that before these events, people were absorbed in their lives, eating, drinking, and marrying, that they forgot about God and His warnings. Today, we are in a similar situation, with many gradually forgetting about God and turning to the lies and deceptions spread by the enemy through influences, media, and governments. Jesus cautioned that some individuals might deviate from their faith, not necessarily due to sin, but because of life's anxieties. Therefore, it's crucial to be aware of the pressures that could weaken our faith. Despite the challenges we face, we should never let anything diminish our love for God. Instead of letting anxiety pull us away from our faith, we should let our faith liberate us from the anxiety that plagues many today. After hearing these words of wisdom from Jesus himself, how should we react? As per the second letter to Timothy 3 1 5, we are living in challenging times. In the last days, people will exhibit negative traits such as selfishness, greed, boastfulness, and disobedience, among others. They will maintain an outward appearance of godliness but deny its true power. We are advised to avoid such individuals. This counsel is unambiguous. We must differentiate ourselves from the rest of the world, steering clear of any group that only presents a facade of godliness but lives contrary to a godly life. Their actions or endorsements reflect a life of disobedience to God's word. As we look forward to the Lord's return with hope and anticipation, we must hold fast to our faith and fervently defend the faith entrusted to us. Let's remain firm, steadfast, and unyielding, remembering that when the Lord returns, He will reward all those who live their lives to please Him. As stated in Revelation 22 verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, to give to each one according to his work. Have you considered what truly matters in life? What would you hold on to if you were moments away from eternity? If you've had a near-death experience, your perspective on life changes drastically. At that moment, nothing else seems important except for one thing, Christ Jesus. It becomes clear that amidst all our worldly pursuits and accomplishments, our union with Christ, made possible by His work on the cross, holds true significance. Let's explore this profound message together and delve into the eternal truth of Christ's cross, which has the power to save our souls and provide us with the assurance of life after death. This message is of utmost importance, and God wants you to pay full attention to it. Don't let anything slip by. Open your heart to receive it now. We never know what the next moment may bring. As highlighted in Galatians 6 verse 14, our greatest pride should be in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the face of eternity, all our worldly pursuits and ambitions lose their value and become insignificant. Let's reflect on a person facing death. For instance, a businessman who meticulously planned a business meeting for the next week, when faced with imminent death, realizes that the meeting loses its importance. The relentless pursuit of wealth no longer dominates his thoughts, and even his passion fades away. This scenario offers a striking parallel to our own lives. The passion for one's favorite football team or the attachment to a beloved home, once seen as treasures, may seem insignificant when compared to the vastness of eternity. This serves as a poignant reminder that the things we strive for and place importance on ultimately hold no relevance in the face of eternity. Material possessions, money, and even our most cherished accomplishments are fleeting when compared to the fundamental question of our eternal destiny. The only thing that truly matters is the cross of Christ, as it plays a pivotal role in determining our eternal fate. Death is an unavoidable reality that will come for all. When it approaches, all our temporal concerns and misguided priorities will dissipate like smoke. Deep down, we know this truth, but we often fail to prioritize our relationship with God, getting lost in the pursuit of success, recognition, and worldly achievements. We must not lose sight of what is eternal. This revelation should serve as a wake-up call, encouraging us to reassess our values and adjust our priorities. Reflecting on the mysteries of life after death raises profound questions. What happens at the end of our earthly journey? What awaits us beyond the threshold of death? Is there a realm called purgatory, or do we simply enter into a sleep until the promised day of resurrection? Hebrews 9 verse 27 provides a clear answer, stating, Just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. 
God's word dispels any notion of an intermediate state after death and emphasizes the reality of judgment following our earthly life. As we come to realize the inevitability of this impending judgment, our lives will change drastically. The understanding that we will be assessed by a holy and eternal God, who will meticulously examine every detail of our existence, drives us to adopt a different way of living. Even the words we speak will be thoroughly analyzed and judged. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8, we revisit the theme of the cross. The message of the cross may seem foolish to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross stands out, differentiating those who follow the path of perdition from those on the path of salvation. Christ's cross is the decisive element for the forgiveness of our sins. Without the events at that cross and the subsequent resurrection, salvation would not have been possible for anyone. In our daily lives, we are constantly distracted and tempted to stray from the true meaning of the cross, seduced by the allure of worldly achievements, wrapped up in the pursuit of personal gain, and drawn to the fleeting pleasures of this life. Often, we lose sight of the eternal value of the cross. In the face of eternity, these pursuits become insignificant compared to the lasting impact of the cross. It stands out as the central element that differentiates those who are perishing from those being saved and serves as the foundation for the forgiveness of sins. As we navigate the complexities of life, let's keep this teaching at the forefront of our minds. The Gospel's message challenges our limited understanding of sin, often viewed only as severe transgressions or heinous crimes. It points to each one of us and declares that we all fall short of the glory of the Almighty. The Gospel presents a direct and impactful message, revealing a disturbing truth, every person, regardless of societal respect or perceived virtue, is a sinner in the eyes of a holy God. Many are taken aback by this firm assessment of their moral condition and vehemently reject the idea of being labeled as sinners. Instead, they choose to cling to the illusion of their own righteousness. Thus, the message of the gospel becomes offensive to them and difficult to comprehend, a real stumbling block. This happens because they are unwilling to accept the reality of their need for salvation. The idea of redemption seems foolish to them, an insignificant concept that is easily dismissed. Many find comfort in their achievements, acts of charity, and moral righteousness, believing such commendable actions are enough to secure their standing before God. They are seduced by the deceptive belief that the message of the cross is unnecessary, trusting that they can achieve salvation through their own efforts and merits. The world reinforces this illusion, perpetuating the lie that the cross is irrelevant in our lives. However, it is crucial to resist this falsehood and accept the uncomfortable truth that our goodness by itself is insufficient. We must recognize that our own righteousness is not enough to redeem us. There is no need to look further for examples to realize the growing culture of disregard for human life in today's world. Simply pick up a smartphone and browse the internet to find the hostility that permeates the planet. We observe an unprecedented increase in murders, armed conflicts, and acts of terrorism. More than at any other time in the last 90 years, more lives have been lost in wars than in the previous 500 years combined. Only in the last century, it is estimated that 203 million people lost their lives in wars, and in the last decade alone, approximately 2 million children were murdered, and another 4 to 5 million were disabled due to conflicts. Given this reality, it is hard not to think that divine judgment is near. But regardless of whether the rapture happens first or we leave this world for eternity, the crucial question remains, are we prepared to meet our Creator as we are now? Do we have a relationship with Jesus? Listen, set aside the concerns of this life. In the end, what will truly matter is your connection with Jesus. It doesn't matter your bank balance or social status, Instagram followers, or other social media, but how prepared your soul is. Let us surrender our hearts to the Lord at this moment, repent, and be steadfast in truth, regardless of the cost. Let's pray for God to guide our hearts to the things of the Spirit and free us from the bonds of corruption that dominate the world. May our love for God become our main motivation and grant us certainty about our eternity. Amen.